In this section, I'll be sharing with you some of the tips, tools, and techniques that you can use to help you to create a balanced, sustainable, and holistic menstrual care routine. In part nine, we'll cover the fundamentals of cyclical living. Part 10 covers the fundamentals of menstrual hygiene. Part 11 deals with period stigma and taboo. And finally, in part 12, we'll explore the wisdom that comes with an understanding of menstruation and of menstrual blood. This is session number nine. In this session, we'll discuss the four phases of your menstrual cycle in a little bit more detail. Then we'll talk about creating a theme for each phase in order to keep you motivated. And then we'll talk about how to stay motivated. Cyclical living means to live your life in a way that is as closely aligned with your reproductive cycle as possible. So that means to organize your schedule and to organize your life events and to live a lifestyle that is as closely aligned with the phases of your menstrual cycle or reproductive cycle as you can possibly get. It's not always going to be perfect, but the idea is to live in alignment and in balance with the natural processes with nature. In the previous sessions, you learned about the details of each of the four phases of the menstrual cycle and also about the overlaps. And you also learned how to create a plan or a strategy for each one of those phases. So in this session, what I'm going to do is condense all of that and simplify it by giving each of those phases a specific theme and you can change up the theme as you wish. By creating a theme for each phase, it'll make it so much easier for you to understand, for you to follow, and a lot simpler for you to be motivated to stick with it. So how exactly does cyclical living work? So I'm going to give you some examples of the themes that I chose for my personal lifestyle and for my cycle, for my cyclical living strategy. And then you can kind of take that as a basis for how you might create your own. For the follicular phase, the theme I chose for this phase is bold new beginnings. Next, for the ovulation phase, the theme I chose for this one is Express Yourself. During this phase, a mature ovum is released from the ovary. Your sex hormones, they begin to peak and your womb starts to prepare for the fertilized egg. All right, next is the luteal phase, which is often the most tricky and hard to balance because there's so much happening in this phase. And the theme I chose for this phase is to prepare or to be ready for anything can happen. During this phase, the unfertilized egg disintegrates, estrogen and progesterone begins to plummet and the lining of the uterus begins to break down. So how about you? Will you break down during this phase? Or will you decide to create something new to boost your hormones and to prepare for the next phase in the cycle or to prepare for the menstrual phase? And then finally we have the menstrual phase. And for this phase, the theme I chose was relax, release, reset. During this phase, the bleeding begins. The lining of your uterus slips away as your womb cleanses itself a new egg is about to form in the ovary so this is where the overlap begins between the menstrual phase and the follicular phase a new cycle is about to begin and you should do the same to relax to release and to reset this is session number 10 the fundamentals of cyclical living i want to start off this session with a quick word of gratitude because I am grateful to be able to live in a part of the world where I do have access to a lot of the products that we are going to be discussing today and also to basic things like clean and affordable water and to sanitation methods. I am keenly aware of the fact that unfortunately there are so many individuals 
Even in a resource rich country like the one I live in, individuals and whole communities who don't have access to these basic necessities. And so I never take those things for granted. I do know that it's not always available to everyone. And if the 2020s has taught us anything, it's that the most basic necessities can be taken away or could be gone uh, in a second. So assuming you already do have access to the basics, let's get into the details of what it takes to practice and to maintain good menstrual hygiene. All right, so let's look at menstrual hygiene from the outside in. So a few simple rules when it comes to menstrual hygiene. It's a few simple rules that I like to stick by anyway, and I feel it works, and so I'm going to pass it on to you or not a rule, but let's just call it a guide. Guide number one or tip number one is to keep it simple. Tip number two is less is best. In general, reusable menstrual products cost less over time and they last longer and they're more reliable than disposables. And so we'll end off this session with a quick look at some of the options that you may want to consider using for managing your menstrual hygiene. This is session 11, period stigma and taboo. In this session, we're gonna get into the dark side of menstruation. Why was it made taboo and why is it still stigmatized? Is period equity a solvable problem? Is menstruation gender neutral or is it all just politics? Let's explore some of the possible answers to those questions and more. So before we get into taboo and stigma, let's talk a little bit about menstruation and femininity before the curse. And this also gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about how the serpent became the logo for my sacred blood. So before the curse, across many cultures, similarities between the female and the serpent were undeniable. And the image of the serpent was widely associated with female sexuality and was used as a symbol of life. One of those similarities, of course, was the slewing of the skin. The serpent shedding its skin is similar to the shedding of the lining of the uterus. And that's the reason why the serpent became the logo of my sacred blood. Now, after the rise of patriarchal civilizations and societies and religious dogma, the snake was reviled and it came to be associated with evil. Western culture has long reviled the snake, associating it with evil and temptation. But at the dawn of civilization, the snake was a positive symbol of feminine energy. Egyptians perceived the snake as a beneficent vital creature intimately associated with female sexuality and, by extension, with life. A snake's sinuous mode of locomotion is evocative of a nubile woman's walk and dance. Her movements in the throes of lovemaking are serpentine, and in contrast to the mechanical pumping of the male. In some cultures, orgasm has been likened to the release of the latent energy of a coiled snake. Snakes also resemble three other important life-affirming images, the meander of rivers, the roots of trees and plants, and the umbilical cord of mammals. There can be no structure that better symbolizes the idea of a mother nurturer than an umbilical cord. Its form resembles two snakes entwined about each other. Rising out from a placenta's sinuous blood vessels, the umbilical cord might easily inspire the notion that snakes were vital to life. Confirming that two entwined snakes are the perfect image to represent life, in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick discovered DNA's configuration to be a double helix, the crucial molecule basic to all life. Further, snakes live in deep crevices and fissures in the earth, tying them to the Great Mother. And because a snake regularly sheds its skin to begin anew, it can easily be imagined as an immortal creature that does not die and is thus a potent symbol of rebirth. The Ouroboros, the snake forming a circle to bite its own tail, was a recurring theme in Neolithic art and occurs in almost all early cultures. Many archaeologists believe that this symbol represents the cyclical constancy of the feminine. Snakes' association with vitality is so embedded in our psyches that the caduceus, two entwined snakes, remain as a symbol of the healing arts. 
Finally, the snake is associated with wisdom. Its eye is the opening to mystic insight and foresight. So connected in the Egyptian psyche were beneficent serpents and goddesses that the hieroglyph for goddess was the same as the one for serpent. This is session number 12, Blood Wisdom. Pass it on. We're going to start this session with a quick summary of sessions 1 to 11, and then we'll talk more about why it's so important for you to share your blood wisdom, including and especially once you've reached menopause. Plus, once you've completed sessions 1 to 12, you'll also receive a detailed ebook that includes questionnaires and worksheets that will prepare you for your future role as a holistic menstrual mentor, should you accept the challenge. Let's begin. And in this 12th and final session of the series, it's all about the blood. Things about menstruation and menstrual blood that is not commonly known or not known at all. And so we're going to talk about the nature of the blood, the secrets it holds, including blood magic, rituals, and alchemy, and also the power and the wisdom in the blood, and why all of that makes it so sacred and why it's so important to pass on that wisdom once you attain it.